as it does. All right. First of all, I just want to thank the Wisconsin Archaeological Society for hosting this talk. Um, Rob for invi inviting me to speak and everyone for coming out this evening, even though I know it's spring break. That's a lot of feedback. Still doing it? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so tonight, I'll be speaking a little bit about the origins of village in the Ohio Valley uh, during the 11th and 12th centuries AD, um, what's termed Fort Ancient. I'll be exploring the origins of these villages and considering what it means to become a member of what were newly formed communities. And just to ground us, a village is referring to a cluster of permanent domestic structures and that community concentrated on a specific and restricted locality. There's lots of definitions for villages, but we're gonna keep it pretty simple for tonight. I'm gonna to be examining two early Fort Ancient villages near Cincinnati, Ohio, Gard and Turpin. These are two of the earlier villages in the region. Um, they offer case studies into early village life in Ohio as well as generally. These sites have been excavated um, with the help of two Ohio State field schools and the work of myself and Dr. Robert Cook and several other graduate students. We'll have a little bit of background just to orient us in time and space and culture as I don't expect Wisconsin archaeologists to be too familiar with Ohio. So Fort Ancient sites are found in the middle Ohio Valley, which is southeast Indiana, southern Wisconsin, or southern Ohio, western West Virginia, and northern Kentucky. And right, so uh, Columbus, Ohio would be up here. Dayton would be around there. Indianapolis, Cincinnati is where we'll be focusing on. Now specifically, these sites are located on the Ohio River and its major tributaries to the north and the south. The Great and the Little Miami River in the Miami Valley, the Scioto River, the Hocking River, and the Licking River into Kentucky. Sites are found both on the floodplains as well as in the highlands adjacent to these major rivers. The entire region would have been hardwood, hardwood deciduous forests with pocket prairies to the west. The north is flat, glaciated terrain. Um, and becoming increasingly rugged as you move south and east into the foothills of and into the Appalachians themselves. Uh, Fort Ancient dates between 1000 and 1700, but we'll be going back just a bit further in time to give us a little bit of a run up to what's happening. We'll briefly touch on Hopewell, because when I say I do Ohio, everyone asks me what Hopewell is, and if I do it, I don't. A little bit of the late woodland, and then on into the Mississippian world. Sorry if you're looking for Hopewell stuff, the next two slides are what you're going to get. <laughs> Ohio Hopewell. Briefly, we can't do it justice in a 45-minute talk on Fort Ancient, but um, they're one of many related traditions between 100 BC and AD 500. And in Ohio, you get one of the or the most intense or elaborated forms of these traditions, um, focused particularly right in the southern half of Ohio, as my hand shakes badly. Um, the Hopewell lived in dispersed communities, isolated but very large houses. This is an excavation of a 12 meter by 12 meter house, um, probably housing a single extended family. Um, built using what's called single post construction, so you can see the individual posts, one, 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 one. The houses were located on terraces on the floodplains, and the people subsisted on the eastern agricultural complex. So domesticated kinopodium, sunflower, and squash. Now, I say the communities are dispersed, but what are they dispersed around? Mounds, earthworks, right? This is what we think of when we think of the Hopewell. Uh, they range in form and scale from single conical mounds to massive, complex, multiple earthworks with hilltop enclosures, landform enclosures, and geometric enclosures with circles and squares and octagons. And they can, they can enclose 75 to 100 acres easily of land. Now, it's in this mound context that Hopewell exists, at least as archaeologists consider it, right? You get exotic materials from tremendous distances, the Hopewell interaction sphere. Ornate, high artistic skill items, complex mortuary activities, and mound construction, all working together to integrate these dispersed people of isolated farms into a single community. Now, around 84 to 500, Hopewell ends. There's no more exotic materials coming into the region. The massive earthwork construction ends. Uh, this form of symbolism drops out of the record. 
This marks the beginning of the late woodland period in Ohio, which went from about AD 500 to 1000. Getting a little closer. Now, unlike Wisconsin, the late woodland in Ohio isn't studied very much. We don't have your beautiful effigy mounds, and they're not doing the Hopewell mounds anymore, so it can get lumped into what's called the good gray cultures, often dismissed as low visibility and not really present. But they're not entirely invisible. See, they were originally called the intrusive mound culture due to a practice of interring their dead into the already present Hopewell mounds. This is visible, right? And they're continuing to reuse these Hopewell sites. Additionally, mound building doesn't stop entirely. Conical mound construction and even simple enclosures, um, again, visible in the record, um, appear, and they seem to be serving the same purpose, although the scale and frequency is reduced. But still, these sites continue to function to integrate dispersed populations into communities. So we say dispersed. What does that mean for late woodland? The populations are thought to be small and mobile, or at least relative to the later Fort Ancient and probably the Hopewell as well, and perhaps more focused on hunting than on the eastern agricultural complex, though it's hard to say. The bow and arrow comes in, on, in at this time, and there's a lot of focus on the bow and arrow, so it might be distorting our understanding. But in approximately 950, if we were to look at the Ohio Valley, you would see small mobile groups returning to Hopewell or their own mine sites in larger groups to perform ritual activity, integrating these dispersed populations into communities. So moving on in geography a little bit, contemporary, at least to the Fort Ancient, um, here's a map of the Mississippian world and where the Fort Ancient fit up here. Now, this is the kind of map you would find online. I enjoy using these maps, figuring that if someone Googled what the heck I'm talking about, they might pop up on this, on one of the first two or three uh, pictures on the Google image search. That's not the worst. Um, Fort Ancient is the northeastmost extension of the Mississippian world. Uh, it's about 170 miles directly over land to the closest Mississippian mound center, Angel Mounds. Now, it's a little longer, but maybe quicker to sail right down the Ohio River in a boat. Uh, about, so 175 miles to Angel, 300 miles will take you to Cahokia over land, again, further if you were to go down the Ohio and up the Mississippi, and that's where you find Cahokia, right? The beating heartland of this Mississippian culture. Well, why is there this gap that's so easy to get there? And in comparison, how come you get this nice blended gap, blended overlapping area everywhere? Briefly, we can look at Wisconsin to understand. Just down the road, we have Aztalan, right? A multi-mound Mississippian site classic Middle Mississippians. Ten miles away, there's Lake Koshkanong, where there are Oneota communities. Interacting, not interacting, I'll let other people look at that. In northern Illinois, you have Norris Farms, which is a famous site where Oneota and Middle Mississippian communities were overlapping in territory, and their interactions were famously quite violent in this case. I'm not going to lecture you on Wisconsin, Oneota, and uh, Mississippians, but this is what those blended lines are suggesting here in contrast with what we see in Ohio, which is to say there's no Aztalan in the Ohio Valley. So why are they Mississippian and what is Fort Ancient? So real quick, like I said, Middle Ohio Valley, you keep saying that, but one more time. It, ranges in date from AD 1000 to 1700. You'll sometimes see 1670 at the early end or 1730 at the later end, basically marking Europeans showing up into the middle Ohio Valley and finding it not occupied by people who are easily identifiable as Fort Ancient. It's divided into the early, middle, and late periods with AD 1000 to 1200, the early period. 12 to 1400 is the middle period and the late period is 14 to 1700. This is sometimes called the Madisonville Horizon. Now, if you were to look at a little bit of the, of the archeological record, you might find a chipstone, tech, chipstone tool technology, not chip spoon, chipstone tool technology consisting largely of triangular chipped bifaces associated with the refinement of the bow and arrow that had been introduced earlier. Uh, the symbolism you would find is a reflection of and an adaptation to symbols from Mississippian societies. In the center here, you can see a Mississippian gorget, which was found at Etowah in Georgia, uh, depicting a bird man who has a whelk shell pendant around his neck, and he's holding a rainy knife in his hand. Well, at Fort Ancient sites, we find individuals with whelk shell pendants around their neck and holding rainy knives in their hands. 
that's pretty good. Um, additionally, you can find Ramy pots, a distinctive um, style of ceramic associated with Cahokia and the Middle Mississippians found in Fort Ancient contexts. Now, more typical Fort Ancient pottery would look something like this. It's shell-tempered. It's mostly jars, although you can find bowls and salt pans. The pottery tends to be globular with a hot, tall, flared neck, and it's in this neck where you get a lot of decoration, particularly these interlocking scrolls, which are called guilloches. So here's a curvilinear guilloche. There's a rectilinear guilloche, and you also get line-filled triangles, probably the three most common motifs, but there's lots of ways to decorate pottery at this time. Production was a household-level affair. There's no indication of it full or even part-time specialization. The people were engaged in full-time maize agriculture. They ate a lot of maize. At some sites, up to 90% of their caloric intake is coming from maize. So needless to say, their teeth were not doing too well when it comes to dental caries and lots of... Uh, uh, nutritional stress related to eating that much maize. And relevant to tonight, the population was organized into permanent settlements, a focus of this evening, villages. Now, the Fort Ancient Village is probably best exemplified by Sunwatch Village, which is a middle Fort Ancient site, which is occupied around AD 1400, uh, what, near what's now Dayton, Ohio, on the Great Miami. It's the most extensively excavated and analyzed site and as such, it is considered the model of Fort Ancient culture and sites. So there's a lot resting on this one site. 66% uh, of the site has been excavated, most of it professionally, um, though the eastern third of the site was not excavated. As you, can, as you see this cutoff here, there's an access road running right along that eastern portion of the site. It's still there under the road. They checked in 2005, and it doesn't appear to be damaged. So now no one's allowed to drive on the road. Now, Sunwatch is a circular village arranged in concentric zones, and its population, its population would have been between 250 to 400 people. 400 is probably very high. Um, probably 250 to 300 is more, more likely. Now, it's arranged in concentric zones. Moving from the center outwards, there was a center post highlighted there. Um, when they found it, it was 75 centimeter diameter chunk of cedar, still intact in the 1970s. It hadn't rotted away. Around there, you can see a blank area, right? This is a cleared, well-maintained plaza with very little activity in the form of pits or posts or anything that impacted it too deeply. Around this area was a formal mortuary zone, um, a ring of burials. This is the graveyard. Surrounding this is a ring of trash pits, domestic debris, and activity areas. Around all of that would be a housing zone, and framing the entire village was a palisade. This palisade isn't necessarily an integral part of uh, Fort Anxious Villages, but they have one at Sunwatch. This is a single component site, though there is evidence of it expanding. Um, the palisade, if you look through the outline, you can see cutting through a couple of the houses where they had to kick it back. Now the exception of this plan is one house right here intruding into the burial ring, in the domestic ring, just kind of placed oddly compared to everything else. Now, all of the houses are single post construction, which is an indigenous, local, woodland architectural style. We saw that with the, the, the Hopewell house, right? You dig a post, you dig a hole, you put a post in. You dig a hole, you put a post in. There's one exception. This house in the middle, or towards the middle, which was uh, constructed using what we call wall trench construction. Um, you dig an entire wall's foundation at once, take a prefabricated wall, and you put it up all in one motion. Uh, it's supposed to be quicker, um, but it's associated with Mississippians, not the local woodland tradition of construction. Oh, it cuts it off on the bottom. All right. Where am I? Uh, three houses to the west are worth notice, noting uh, when discussing the village layout. Um, now, most of these houses are domestic structures, but these three are spatially distinct, right? They're isolated from the rest of the site you know, through these big gaps, and even from each other. They're not tightly clustered together. All right, one of these houses is known as the big house. It's the largest structure in the site. Um, and it's not likely a residence, most likely serving as a communal structure, such as a meeting house. Um, the house was built, a house to the north of that, my mistake, was built entirely of cedar poles and filled with FCR. Again, it's not a domestic signature. One possible interpretation is that it served as a sweat lodge. 
Now, if we remember the whelk shell pendant when we discussed Mississippian symbols, an individual, a male, was found buried right there uh, with a whelk shell pendant around his neck. He also had a wolf jaw headdress, and he's really the only individual with such overt decorations suggesting of status or something special about him. Now, there's a reason it's called Sunwatch, and that's due to the potential of there being a celestial plan organizing the village, particularly along this solstice line and then implying the other solstice line. This may or may not be true. Um, some of the other possibilities are this is actually an indication of understanding cardinal directions of north being associated with, with the upper world or the heavens, the south being associated with the underworld, and west being where the upper and lower underworld meet. Um, it could just be a happenstance of building a circle, but it's worth noting that, again, all, this other line, all these other lines of evidence are saying something special is happening in that western quadrant. So this pattern is found across middle and late Fort Ancient sites, but it's also repeated beyond the region, right? The Fort Ancient don't invent this pattern. Um, across the Midwest and the Southeast, other Mississippian villages share this layout. And central to this pattern um, is a feature, often a wooden post, although sometimes there's a large pit or a special structure sitting in the middle of, of, these, house, of, of these villages. Now, this feature has been interpreted a number of ways as an axis mundi, right? So like it's the center of the universe, an ancestor is a dedicatory event, a celestial guide, a ritual stage, and likely was simultaneously serving in many, if not all, of these roles at once. Okay, enough background. We know what the middle and late villages look like, we know what came before them, but what do they look like during the early Fort Ancient period? Um, one question would be, do they even exist? And some people would say no. I'll say yes, right? We're gonna look at two villages that are solidly dated to the early Fort Ancient period located near Cincinnati, Ohio. The guard site is west of Cincinnati near the Great Miami, where the Great Miami runs into the Ohio, so just on the Indiana side of the border. It's on the floodplains of the Ohio, nestled among the Oxbow Lakes from the Great Miami's various meanderings. We have 17 AMS dates here, delineating an occupation between 1050 and 1250. On the east side of Cincinnati, where the Little Miami and the Ohio River meet, is the Turpin site, which is on a ridge overlooking the Little Miami. We have 12 dates here, uh, dating Turpin between AD 1100 and 1275, so a little, potentially a little bit later in time. Now here's a drone shot of guard. Um, you can see the site is going to be located down here. Here's one of the Oxbow Rivers, the Miami River. Great Miami runs this way. The Ohio River is just on this side here. And if you watch this road and railroad tracks and this tower and this cluster of trees, I'm going to switch over to a different map. Because in 2011, uh, we performed some magnetometry on the site with very very encouraging results. It appears to show a series of square houses arranged in a ring around the central area. Here's that power tower we saw before. Here's that cluster of trees. There's actually a, a farmstead underneath there. And here's the road and the railroad tracks running through the southeast of the site. So in 2012, we had to go out and ground truth the mag data to prove that these are really houses. They are. So in the west, we found an eight meter long house. It had been burned. Um, most or some of the timbers had been removed because we didn't in, uh, uncover the entire wall and ceiling or anything, but we found some timbers. We also recovered the burned daub and mud slumping from uh, wattle and daub construction and burned grass, which might have been thatch. This house was constructed with single post construction, so that local technique. All right, early houses, local technique. House two up in the north here, um, was four and a half meters long. It too had been burned, uncovering not enough timbers to say it was the whole house. This had been capped with a 10 to 15 centimeter thick layer of shell. Very confusing. Um, the west wall was wall trench, Mississippian style, while the east wall was single post. So we've got two competing styles of architecture here, a, tr a local style and a non-local style. House three in the south was six meters long, not burned, although there was an antler offering just beyond the east wall, and both of the walls here were wall trench. 
So we now have a single post construction house, a wall trench house, and a hybrid house. Okay. We returned, we tried to excavate an entire house, which proved optimistic. We got half of it. House four was five by six meters, and it too had been burned. Um, with some or most of the timbers removed, we did uncover some, as well as more of that burned thatch. It had been capped with a 10 to 15 centimeter thick layer of shell, and all four of the walls were wall trench. The, um, here's the two units we dug, so we got two corners of the house, wall trench construction. Here's photos of the same thing. Just to the north of the house, a dog, minus his poor hindquarters, had been placed. Okay, definitely houses. We start to look at this plaza, and it's just really noisy. So why is that? Now, it might be related to this house here, historic house. There's this construction and all this noise up here. So maybe it's just geophysical noise and field trash. But if we draw all the houses in, and we assume that the most prominent blotches that aren't metal are features, we would get a plan that looked like this. So we can see a very different looking central area at guard as we do at Sunwatch. Um, we probed some of these anomalies and they sure looked like features. So this summer, we excavated them, 16 of them. Most of them looked like this, um, basin-shaped refuse pits. They're non-stratified, there are no events apparent in them, and they're just filled with domestic debris. No ornamentation, pipes, or pendants, which actually is unusual uh, based on other places we've dug. We found one deep straight-sided storage pit, about two meters deep, 1.8 meters wide. Um, could have held a whole lot of food in this pit. Now, moving to the center, that's only 14 of our pits. We found this, which appears to be a centrally located post, right? 50 centimeters wide, 90 centimeters deep, with a uh, slip trench coming off to the side and chinking stones holding it in place. Um, the post had been removed. So we started asking questions immediately, right? Is this the center post, or is this just a post that sits in the center? Well, two meters north, um, we think we solved that problem. We found an anomaly that began similar to the rest of the refuse pits, but it was very different. About 80, 90 centimeters down, there's this really thick layer of burning, just solid across the entire, the entire feature, which we didn't see anything looking like an event at the other site. Underneath it was a layer of ash, and nestled in this ash was a dog's cranium. And at the very base of the entire feature was this, see this black layer? That's a thin layer of burned maize um, and some sort of plant material, maybe corn silk, maybe a mat. We couldn't find any weaving in it, but um, we took, took samples. We'll try to figure out exactly what it is. Now, uh, all the corn in here were just the kernels. There were no cobs. Uh, there was another concentration of burned corn up in this burned layer, about a seven cubic centimeter, just massive corn, all kernels, no cobs. So there's some kind of ritual offering, to abuse the R word, adjacent to the center post. So we're feeling a little more positive that it's a center post, not just a central post. So what do I see? I see storage and refuse pits throughout the plaza then, not just along an outer ring like you do at Sunwatch. Again, the exception being that center post and offering. So this map is real. It just is very different than Sunwatch, especially related to the plaza. Now, real quick, this isn't the only work that's been done. Uh, the landowner excavated avocationally in the 1980s in the southeast portion of the site. We have his unit information and maps, and every artifact has context connecting it to a unit. Um, he uncovered 21 burials. Uh, to date, our excavations haven't uncovered any, though we've been trying to not find burials if possible. This is where the Raimi knife was discovered, found held in the hand of a young man. Um, it was made of kale and chert, so the knife style is from the American bottom, and kaolin is sourced to the American bottom, so near Cahokia. Now it gets a little better because strontium analysis on the teeth of the individuals here was performed, and the gentleman holding the Ramey knife had spent his childhood in the lower Miami Valley in Cincinnati. His teen years, when his molars erupted, he spent in southern Illinois, and then he was laid to rest sometime in his mid to late 20s, back in the Cincinnati area. So there's something going on, Southern Ohio, Southern Illinois, 
and Cahokia is a pretty, not the only, but a pretty prominent um, smoking gun in the room or, or person in the room. Now one other wrinkle as we go back to these hypothesized zones of activity and I tried to put it over Turpin or over Guard, is this red circle here in the woods underneath the foundation of the house are anywhere between one and three Hopewell mounds. So this, at this point, thousand year old tradition, 500 to 1,000 year old tradition is smack dab in the middle. You don't see anything like that at Sunwash, although you do get that one Mississippian house. Maybe there's some local tradition, deep past tradition going on. Anyway, so the structure of guard is generally similar to a classic Fort Ancient site with the key differences. There's no central plaza, no cleared area where people can meet. Where can you fit three to 500 people, which is an estimate of population at guard without someone having to stand in garbage? How can you dance if someone keeps putting hundreds and hundreds of three foot wide holes in the middle of your dance floor, right? It's questions I had to ask. Let's move on to the other site, Turpin. Now this is situated on a ridge east of Cincinnati on the Little Miami. And we did magnetometry again in the cleared area. It's not quite as apparent, but there's a cluster of houses in the west arranged around an empty plaza. Lots of historic disturbances and then a couple of houses on the east before the landform falls off. Uh, there's a ridge to the north of the site. In the south of the site, there's a ridge and a highway. Um, there's a historic farmstead here. And a road runs through the east of the site. This is a very clear Fort Ancient tradition, right? There's a road on the east of every site. Now, we excavated a house in the east and the west. Um, so here's house one. We placed two trenches trying to find each wall. House one had a five by six meter house, all four walls, wall trench construction. It had a prepared clay floor, which we hadn't found yet, so they just stamped the clay or spread clay. And there's this puddled clay heart, which is a prepared heart, so instead of just burning your fire on the ground, you pile this little donut of clay and you'd have your fire in there. You find this at Sunwatch and other later sites. It had, house two had one trench placed across it. Um, it was rebuilt twice, um, each building event using wall trench construction. So there were two series of three parallel wall trenches. And because of this, the house was somewhere between four and six meters in length. It's hard to say for sure. And this turned out to be a massive pit filled with FCR, fawn, um, deer bone, and freshwater mussel. Again, we're not the first people to put our shovels in the ground. In the 1940s, uh, the Cincinnati Museum excavated the site, focusing on two mounds, a Fort Ancient mound um, to the south of the landform and a late woodland mound on the north. They documented what they called a village uh, near the farm set in the north, uh, but looking at their notes and photos, um, they found two houses, so probably there's not a whole village up here. Um, these houses were single post construction. So what does Turpin look like? It's north and the south. Sorry. North and the south, it's bounded by these mounds. And there's an extensive mortuary complex. Um, and it's not just around these mounds. Uh, this entire landform appears to be a, a burial site. Um, as a matter of fact, our interpretation right now is that burial population exceeds what the late woodland and the Fort Ancient would have produced, um, suggesting that people are coming from a long distance to be buried at this location. And strontium analysis of the individuals supports this hypothesis. There's no central plaza or feature, so you just get these two or three house clusters not necessarily organized to a post. But again, the center is just Disturbed and there's a mound running into it, so we're going to return to that. Can't really place Sunwatch over Turpin, right? If I say, oh, the landform is squeezing it, maybe I'm going to get this half crescent, or maybe assume that there's something under the road and get like an almond shaped site. Maybe if I squint, I can see Sunwatch. So this leaves us with two different early village layouts, each different from the classic Fort Ancient Village. So I started to ask, how am I going to start looking at these villages and understanding how they're built and what the people in them are doing and why they're different? So I started to look through the literature in the Midwest and the Southeast looking for comparisons. And I found, among other places, the range site in Southwest Illinois, which is excavated by John Kelly. 
The range site is a sequence of hamlets and villages spanning the late woodland to the late prehistoric. Now, early in the sequence, around AD 6 to 700, um, it's rough, roughly circular, right? Yeah, black squares are houses arranged around this very, very messy plaza. Lots of pits and features and all sorts of nasty stuff in there. Brilliant, that's what I'm looking for, guard. Um, later in the sequence, 750 to 850, the plaza is emptying out. So this seems to be what I'm seeing in Ohio. So let me look a little more closely to see if it gives me any insights. So there's a central feature here, which isn't immediately obvious, but excavation revealed there was a large pit with dedicatory offerings placed in the middle, little, little slightly separated from everything else, uh, but largely separated by these refuse pits. All right. We see house clusters. They're not, they're not arranged evenly across the landscape. And probably more important or more exciting to me is next to these house clusters, you see this little blank spot here, blank spot here, blank spot there, um, are these clear areas, right? There's no features. So some sort of miniature, uh, some sort of patios or miniature plazas around the periphery of what otherwise might be considered the main plaza. So if I look at guard, I can see, yes, the houses aren't just in a ring, but they also are forming clusters, particularly this really nice one in the northwest. Right? The rest are, you know, these circles are just suggestions. But again, you're seeing these clear areas where there aren't pits and features and all of those holes in the ground. So again, so maybe that we've got some patios forming at guard. So with this information, maybe Turpin makes more sense. So we see these discrete clusters um, arranged around patio groups, right? These little blank areas. Um, this isn't the pattern we see at Sunwatch, which is why I put it back up here, right? All of the noise is right in front of the houses. They don't have little clear areas next to them, which we would consider a patio group. Uh, this area here was excavated avocationally. That's why there's a big blank spot for data. That's not, that's not necessarily real. So you don't have those patios at Sunwatch. So guard is planned a little bit and organized potentially around this central area. Um, with that post organizing the village, and it's incorporated into its plan, at least along the periphery, a landscape of its past, the Hopewell Mound. Right. Turpin also is organized, though not around a center post, but this Ford Ancient Mound is pretty equidistant from, from these clusters, especially if we were to find anything back there. That would be great. So maybe the activities associated with the Ford Ancient Mound is what is, is organizing it on the landscape. And additionally, it also is incorporating its past, this late woodland mound, into its peripheral uh, formation. These earliest villages likely represent communities that are no longer dispersed. They're the conglomeration of multiple smaller units, lineages, clans, those dispersed populations we talked about in the middle and late woodland. Smaller units appear more pronounced and strongly maintained early in iterations, and as such, the sites might best be viewed as several hamlets, hamlets living adjacent to each other rather than as a village. Founding events like the placement of a post um, or the burial of an important individual may have been required to begin the process of village creation and aggregation. However, ongoing events didn't take place in these central places. They couldn't, there's no space. Instead, individual kin groups seem to have maintained their own public places, right? Their private public places. There don't appear to be locations capable of allowing the full population to comfortably gather. So with this, uh, the creation of these large community plazas may have been a tool to encourage conformity and village-centric identity and organization, or it could be the other way around. This is the result of creating villages and identity. You realize that you have a large central place, and you tell Steve to stop digging holes in the middle of the dance floor. So the architecture, to me, was suggestive that maybe early villages weren't cohesive units, like they were later in time, but rather there were individual house clusters maintaining a distinction, a distinction that would be lost later. So I began to look for other uh, evidence for this, and particularly in ceramics. Now, this is a sample of 241 vessels. The full guard and turpin assemblage will be a lifetime of analysis, but here are some uh, samples. Keep in mind these are non 
random, right? I've been moving through context, but visually these appear in line with the overall assemblage. They're all shell tempered, which is good. If they weren't, we might not be in Fort Ancient territory. All right. Um, they tend to be smooth rather than cord marked, though both can be found. And of course, the image I chose is a nice cord marked vessel. Decoration is very common. Um, 131 vessels were decorated. These decorations were mostly curvilinear guilloches, right? these interlocking scrolls, 75 or such. There were three rectilinear guilloches, five Ramy scrolls. These Ramy, Ramy scrolls are Mississippian inspired styles. S and Z cordage was present, uh, 37 S twists, and 12 Z twists. Um, and I said, more analysis being conducted, well, not as we speak, but moving forward to round out the sample. And we'll show you one area where I'm, I'm missing some samples. Now, the main point of analysis going forward tonight will be chemical analysis as performed through portable X-ray fluorescence, or PXRF. PXRF is a non-destructive method where a radiation source, in this case an X-ray tube, excites the electrons and the atoms of material placed in front of the beam. As the individual atoms absorb this energy, they, they change orbital levels. Uh, doing so results in the electrons casting off excess energy. This energy is detected by the X-ray detector. This is displayed as, uh, these energy levels are characteristic to individual elements. If you want to talk about valence electrons, see me afterwards. And it produces a spectrum. This is uh, 150 or so spectra laid over each other, but you get these lovely jagged patterns of how much of any individual element is being detected. These signatures relate to source material. So where the clay comes from that's used to make a pot, or how the recipe is particularly constructed of clays to make a pot. These signatures then reflect the local geography, the clay that's around, uh, the mechanics of ceramic necessities, does the clay fire well, social necessities, such as can you get to the clay you need, as well as artisan choice, what do they prefer to work with, how are they taught to work with the clay. Now we usually think of decorative style, right, when it comes to expressing identity, politics, and ideology, and it absolutely does. Technological choices, in this case recipe, is certainly capable of expressing or at least reflecting similar messages, right? If you're restricted from going to certain areas, that's part of your identity, and that's being reflected in your choices. Um, here we have this summer's Get Up in the Field, where I was fortunate enough to have access to two XRF devices, one from uh, UWM's ARL and one from Bruger Laboratories. So dual-wielding XRF devices was fun. Um, I take three readings from three different locations, interior and exterior if possible. Um, I calibrate the results using a mudstone calibration uh, developed by the ARL, and then use principal component analysis with Mahalanobis distances calculated in order to identify outliers. I've so far sampled 407 shirts, 257 from Guard, on 150 from Turpin. As near as I can tell, these are all individual vessels. So, what does this show? So here's guard, where you get a very clear pattern. You've got this main cluster and a couple of outliers. I'm going to highlight them here, right? So big pattern, green, blue, and this little, little purple outlier there. All right, here we go. So here's the main cluster, highlighted in red, and a couple of sherds that fall within it. The signature is found in all contexts at guard, um, you, um, the north, the west, and the south. You can find classic Port Ancient vessels as well as odd vessels that morphologically I might have said, huh, this might be from somewhere else. The second cluster is found only in the north and the west of the site. So those two northern houses and that larger house in the western section. Again, it contains both typical and atypical looking vessels. The third cluster here in blue is found only in the south and the east of the site. Again, containing both typical and atypical looking vessels. So this purple cluster is all a single vessel. Right? These are three shots, all from vessel 118. So this is nice because it shows how, how three shots will be slightly different. Right? You, you can't just take one shot and go. But they clump up together. It's that guy. Very plain looking vessel. I wouldn't pick it out if I had it on my desk all, all year, which I didn't. I had him there for two months. <laughs> all right, so guard works well. There's clearly something happening with the sources and recipes being used. Turpin here 
doesn't seem to show the same pattern as everything blends together in a large cloud. You get one outlier out here, uh, 2049.1, another couple outliers here, such as 2016.3. These are only one shots on vessels. And it turns out those shots are from paint, so painted vessels. Um, so the XRF is working. It's picking up the paint really well there. I forgot to include. It's just glopped on. It, it very much looks like a, a, um, a very interesting, thick, crude paint job on, on 1049. But all right, so you just get turpentine for you just get this blur and nothing really distinct. So are the sites different? Can I be able to tell if one vessel moved from one site to another? And more importantly with chemical analysis, it's not the, the, the vessel moving from one place to another, but the people carrying the vessel from one place to another. Unfortunately, every single one of the turpin vessels falls inside the main cluster. That's why I called it the main cluster instead of cluster one or turpin one or guard one. But you can see the second cluster, the third cluster, and vessel 118 all pull out very nicely, even when I look at the entire region. So all of Cincinnati area, well, east and west side of Cincinnati, you still get this distinction. So this tells us that Turpin and Guard in bulk are indistinguishable. I'm not going to be able to see vessel movement. However, the Guard shirts that are different really are different. Now, I put these onto maps. Let's see what I could see. Turpin, well, we've got one signature spread across these two clusters. 150 scans in. I'm pretty OK by saying these two house clusters have the same source. Uh, I'm just missing this northern section. All right. Now, this pattern is found later in time. I don't, won't get into it too much. But when I looked at some middle, uh, middle Fort Ancient villages, I found that sites had distinctive clay patterns and clay sources unique to themselves. Um, so this is a, something you find later in time. If we look at guard, though, you can see the distribution of the sherds across the landscape. You get distinct spatial clusters. That green doesn't show up well, does it? Um, purples, it's just a purple circle. All right, so blue, green, and then here's the large regional or, uh, cluster. So what are some implications? Well, I need to rethink Turpin as being a cluster of houses that aren't really related to each other, at least in terms as I've laid it out tonight. They share a ceramic source and recipe, similar to the pattern of known examples in Middle Fort Ancient sites where villages are fully formed and classic and unified. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that Turpin may not be a village, or it may represent a special purpose site and a persistent mortuary landscape with a history extending well beyond the origin of the Fort Ancient community. Turpin could be a, uh, the residence of a smaller number of specialists or caretakers that expanded or shifted over the small landscape over time, which means we just need to rethink the notion of community, village, and what actually is happening with Turpin. Guard does appear to have multiple communities, right? You get this northwest, uh, southeast split. Now, does this relate to the creation of the village? Perhaps two different groups came together and over time grew together and homogenized. Uh, these unique vessels might have been brought from these dispersed communities conglomerating together. So are these curated vessels or curated recipes, individuals with connections to the last generation and their old home, continuing to either make vet vessels with the old source and recipe or continuing to use older vessels? Though the radiocarbon dating is too coarse to determine, Guard may represent a generation ahead of, the for of Turpin's village, at which point unique vessels could have been broken, original recipes regional recipes homogenized, special recipes forgotten, and access to non-local materials restricted, resulting in a local Cincinnati area Fort Ancient source. Also keep in mind that Fort Ancient symbolism as we think of it, those guilloches, are fully formed early. They're already Fort Ancient at this time, at least as we see it archaeologically. I guess I'm not there yet. Um, at Guard, Mississi Mississippian items are located in the southeast of the village, roughly corresponding to that blue area. And they're not found anywhere else, particularly not in this western area if we want to entertain the notion of the west being special. So is there some sort of control of access to Mississippians down here that's not being shared with the rest of the site, but it isn't being parlayed into power? Is their relative proximity to the Hopewell related to their connection with the Mississippians? Right? Um, are the Mississippians and Hopewell somehow being linked? 
is this special area even to the west? Maybe it's to the east, because we need to keep in mind we don't know what the east of these sites look like because roads run through the east of every Fort Ancient Village. All right. Anyhow, I'm seeing that there's some sort of village identity being revealed through ceramic recipe, even if it's an indirect one resulting from the convenience and access to resources. But there are also these smaller units, smaller communities being revealed as well. Obviously, more work needs to be done. Uh, more techniques are going to be implied, applied in the future, such as uh, neutron activation and photography, just to check the XRF and see if I can get multiple lines of evidence identifying these shirts. I'd like to add more context to balance out the numbers, particularly that northern cluster from Turpin. And I need to do more work on architecture, house sizes, distances to center post, all sorts of measuring um, that I just haven't had a chance to do yet. These are all questions to include in the future. I'm going to end um, with these layouts as I start to think of new questions to ask and see these results. So these standard Fort Ancient models really don't apply, equally at least, to early sites. They didn't ap appear fully formed in the record, borrowed whole cloth from Mississippians. There's a linkage to the past and Mississippians and village social and physical organization. And I need to think about how these populations come together from groups of 20 to 30 or 50 into groups of 3 to 500, and what they need to learn and how they have to act in order to change and live in a village successfully. So these are the questions I'll be asking with this data going forward. I'd like to thank Mike Sedler, Rob Cook, Bob Jeske, Pat and John Ritzerge, my committee, Aaron Comstock, and a whole bunch of people for helping me get this done. Are there any questions? Not obviously, no. Um, there's variation at Sunwatch, but that four to six meters seems to be pretty, pretty standard. Yeah, Ms. Kehoe. My house next door to the house room is the windless. Mm -hmm. Temporary. 